Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this Friday, December 2nd, 2011, InfoWars Nightly News Broadcast. I'm Aaron Dykes. Coming up, we have an exclusive interview with Pepe Escobar, Asia Times writer and geopolitical correspondent, to discuss Syria, Pakistan, what it means for China, Russia, and everything else on the geopolitical map. We also have exclusive reports from Alex Jones and Darren McBreen. But first, we have probably more news than I've ever seen on the plate tonight, and unfortunately, it seems to go from bad to worse. Uh, turns out the Goldman Sachs conspiracy theorists were right all along. That's Madison Rupert's report up on Infowars.com today discussing how all along we've said insiders were getting tips from Hank Paulson. However, this isn't quite a brand new revelation given the fact that in October 2009, Andrew Ross Sorkin exposed that Paulson met with the entire Goldman Sachs board in a hotel suite in Moscow in June 2008. During that meeting, Paulson spoke of the need for government to have the power to wind down trouble firms, offering a preview of his upcoming speech. That article breaks down this Reuters article, Hank Paulson's Inside Jobs, uh, where today we learn that Goldman's meeting in Moscow was not some kind of aberration. A few weeks later, in July 28, 2008, all before the crisis began, Paulson met with a who's who of the hedge fund world in headquarters at Eaton Park Capital Management, a fund founded by former Goldman superstar Eric Mendich. Uh, so he was giving insider tips there. Many have uh, broken down how it looks like there's enough uh, information to criminally indict him and prosecute him. Meanwhile, uh, we reported on this two years ago. Have you heard about the $16 trillion bailout the Federal Reserve handed to the two big to fail banks? Of course, the $700 billion was just a smokescreen for a far greater sum. Uh, as I mentioned in 2009, uh, we, as well as Bloomberg, reported on the $23.7 trillion in total commitments from the Federal Reserve during the bailout. Now there's a GAO government report breaking down $16 trillion of that money and where it went. Uh, the banks are, of course, predictable and familiar at this point. Citigroup got $2.5 trillion, Morgan Stanley some $2 trillion, uh, Merrill Lynch almost $2 trillion, Bank of America $1.3 trillion, Barclays, Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs, Royal Bank of Scotland, Deutsche Bank, UBS, J.P. Morgan Chase, Credit Suisse and all the others are also on the list. An incredible sum of money given away from taxpayers through our bizarre commitment in the Federal Reserve. If there's ever been a better time to put a spotlight there, it's now. Former New York Federal Reserve stooge Geithner and current Treasury Secretary, meanwhile, is accusing opponents of reform of jeopardizing the financial sector's strength, saying he forces Working against the reform, he said forces working against the reform were blocking appointments to oversight positions, cutting funding, proposing new legislation to repeal parts of the Dodd-Frank law and trying to slow regulation in the hopes of watering it down. Uh, that's just rearranging chairs on the Titanic, as you can imagine. Meanwhile, former Goldman Sachs stooge and New Jersey senator as well as governor John Corzine uh, executive of MF Global at the time it went belly up, has now been subpoenaed. He will have to appear before a congressional panel and explain his role in that firm's collapse with still more than $1.2 in missing customer money. Uh, I wouldn't expect too much, though. Don't hold your breath for true justice there. But at least he has to speak up for himself. We've had Gerald Salente and others on the program other incredible news today, Wisconsin governor wants to introduce fee to protest. Exercising First Amendment right will cost $50 per hour per Capitol Police officer. That's Steve Watson's report. And they supposedly have some law already on the books in the state where you can be liable for uh, using state facilities. It goes on to explain how inside the Capitol protest, groups of four or more will have to apply for a permit 72 hours before and pay. Protest outside the Capitol, uh, groups of 100 or more would have to pay, as well as for damage and cleanup costs. Uh, kind of a funny quote here. I'm a little skeptical about charging people to express their First Amendment opinion. Law professor Edward Fallon told reporters, you can't put a price on the First Amendment. He's a little skeptical or it's supposed to be a fundamental right never to be violated. Just disgusting. Uh, 
Of course, the indefinite detention bill passed 93 to 7 in the Senate. Similar version in the House has gone through. They have to reconcile it. Uh, the Senate last night codified into law the power of the U.S. military to indefinitely detain an American citizen with no charge, no trial, and no oversight whatsoever in the passage of S. 1867, the National Defense Authorization Act. And though the White House has threatened to veto this bill, the fact that the Obama administration's lawyers yesterday reaffirmed their backing for state-sponsored assassination of U.S. citizens would suggest otherwise. And, of course, there are a number of executive orders and precedents of executive overreach, which already have uh, many aspects of this on the book. But the idea of passing this legislation is, of course, nightmarish. Paul Joseph Watson has also uncovered an even worse amendment in this bill, which was narrowly defeated. Uh, this amendment would have made the Senate bill... Uh, give it allowance to detain Americans even after they had been found innocent. Uh, the details of that report are up on Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. But before you go to those websites, I do want to draw attention to a little bit of the details. Amendment number 1274 would have given the federal government the power to detain U.S. citizens until Congress declared the war on terror over, which we've been told is a never-ending multi-generational conflict. The provision also gave the feds the power to keep an American incarcerated even if it were tried and found not guilty. So much monstrous legislation coming through this larger National Defense Act. Of course, Alex Jones and many other patriots have cried shame over it, but are ordinary Americans even paying any attention to it at all with Black Friday and the holiday season underway? Uh, to find out, we went to Darren McBreen. The National Defense Authorization Act empowers the U.S. military to operate on American soil. They can arrest American citizens and cart them off to detention centers anywhere in the world. Basically turning the entire homeland into a battlefield and allowing the military to arrest individuals and detain them indefinitely without trial. Now this violates every aspect of a free society by denying Americans their constitutionally protected right to due process. How do you think the average American is going to respond? The same way they responded at the Kent State Massacre when uh, National Guard troops were used to fire live ammunition on students who were nonviolently protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, the American public was outraged. The military is here to defend us, not to prosecute us and arrest us and throw us in jail. I think it's a sneak attack by Congress and people to, you know, counter the movement on Wall Street. These people are saying that the passing of the bill Basically, it means to them that the Rubicon has been crossed, that uh, this means America will become complete and possibly irreversible a totalitarian military state. Well, then our only hope is some defective armed force members. I think that's our only chance, is the military needs to enforce our Constitution and our congressmen are trampling over the rules that were established over 200 years ago. And... That's the whole problem. There's too much corruption in the executive branch and in the congressional. What would you say to active military who are who might be told to enforce this bill? Listen, I'm a, I'm a veteran of the United States Army, 31 uniform, airborne. And I, I'll tell you what. Very simply, we take an oath to protect this country from threats both foreign and domestic. It's not good. It's not healthy for our democracy for the American Army to be involved. For those people who say that, oh, it could never happen here, it could never happen to us, uh, those are called the famous last words. Uh, many times throughout history, uh, situations have happened where governments have turned their military against its citizens. You know what? History repeats itself. If that eventuality does happen, we have to, you have to remind yourself that these are your brothers and sisters and neighbors and, and people you went to school with. And uh, remember what you're truly fighting for. It's for our Constitution, not for these... Uh, puppets who are actually our servants who have run amok. Now, Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers, recently appeared on the InfoWars Nightly News, and he warned people that we are now at the point where all that will save liberty in America is another American revolution. But really, you should see this as, as a declaration of war against the American people. That's how we should see it. We need to stop this right now. If we don't, Alex, I do believe that there will be no recourse except another revolution. Otherwise, we are going to be lost. We will be put in the same position as the Founding Fathers were in 1775. I want to tell the military and police, 
The globalists are going to sit offshore and watch you get chewed up in a fight with the American people. Uh, it's very important that police and military really make a decision now which side they're going to be on. The military, you're right, choose now whom you shall serve. Either you are, I'm talking to the military out there especially, either you are a son of the republic and you will defend the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, or you are a traitor to your country and you are nothing but a, but a lowly dog, an obedient dog to the powers that be. Choose now whom you shall serve. There's a lot of constitutionalists out there who are in such an uproar that they are saying that this bill places us in almost exactly the same position that our forefathers were in when they were forced to take up arms in defense of liberty in, back in 1775. Well, to those people, I would say it's a culmination of things that have put us in that position. And I would agree that the architects, the great and highly intelligent architects that constructed our infrastructure, the way we do business and the way we do politics and the way we live here in America, they would turn over in their graves and they would be very ashamed of us and how far we've let this go. Indefinite detention without due process leaves citizens without the legal protection of the Constitution, and it strikes at the very heart of the essence of U.S. law. It is positively shameful that any elected representative would even consider voting for such an assault on so sacred a fundamental value as the right to due process. I'm Darren McBreen for InfoWars Nightly News. And of course, John McCain is the one who introduced legislation in 2010 along very similar lines. Great report from Darren. He obviously put a lot into it, but we don't do what the mainstream media does, interview 40, maybe 100 people, and then show just the handful who fit in with our views. We're going to show you the other people who will accept any government power and probably even serve to enforce that undue power. Let's go to that side of the report now. What do you think is going to be the response of American citizens once they start seeing American troops on the street. I think that most people are going to be divided. I don't do anything wrong, so I don't have anything to fear, so I'm not afraid of the, the military. The military being on the streets of America, there's a new bill that's being passed. It's a great idea. I'm all for it. So you support uh, to fight terrorism, military on the streets? Of course, I do. So you think in order to fight terrorism, that would uh, make you feel a little safer, uh, seeing military on the street? Yeah. So I think the only people that are afraid of the military is people that commit crimes or, uh, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that are in criminal organizations. So. And the combination of pure corruption and pure ignorance uh, will be the death of this country. We're going to be back with a whole lot more after this. But just a quick reminder, you support us on this show, getting the word out with these hard-hitting reports, by uh, buying the subscriptions and the DVDs. But right now, for the holiday season, we have an incredible discount, $39.95 for the yearly Prison Planet subscription. You can share it with five other people, or you can get it with 18 of Alex's DVDs and shiny packages to give out as gifts at Christmas or any other holiday. And uh, we would appreciate that support and urge you to do so. Give information instead of plastic junk and everything else. We'll be back in a moment with a whole lot more. Stay tuned. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. I'm Aaron Dykes, and we're back on the InfoWars Nightly News. Of course, coming up, we have Pepe Escobar on everything geopolitical and a report from Alex Jones, but for, first more news. Draconian EPA regulations to cause rolling blackouts. That's another Paul Joseph Watson report from today on how the cost of complying with draconian new EPA rules on carbon emissions will force coal plants in Texas to close and increase the likelihood of rolling blackouts as the Obama administration's vow to bankrupt the coal industry takes full effect. 
Now, of course, we reported on this several times earlier this year on Texas, the key state where more than 50% of power comes from the coal plants, all kinds of insider deals uh, going on with that. But here today, the Austin American Statesman admits what the White House and others said we were lying about previously. Ten months down the line, and the Austin American Statesman reports today that Texas could face power shortages as soon as next year as aging plants are mothballed in response to new environmental standards, according to the state's grid operator and the organization that monitors U.S. power grids for the feds. The report by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation found that many older power plants in Texas will be retired rather than retrofitted to meet new federal emission standards, reports the statesman. And then from the statesman itself, it gets into how many of the well-meaning environmentalist groups are helping to really economically squeeze America even further. Of course, it's not just Texas with these coal plants. They supply to many other states. Environmental groups, however, argued that reserves are generally sufficient and will be augmented by energy efficient measures and new power supplies already being planned. A recent report by the Clean Energy Group Consortium notes that the power providers have other means of handling the state's needs, such as offering customers discounts in exchange for curtailing their electric use when demand is straining the grid. So you've got all this phony environmentalism, uh, the climate change lies, and more, but now they're actually going to be clamping down on industry and American consumption through it. Not that that's entirely a bad deal, but the way they're doing it fits with Agenda 21 and more. So that's in the Austin American Statesman today. And just to remind you, Alex Jones did several reports breaking this down. Again, the White House accused him of lying about it. We're going to play one of those reports right now. Obama hit struggling Americans with energy rate hikes, following Barack Obama's vow to bankrupt the coal power industry. Americans are set to be hit with a wave of utility bill hikes as draconian EPA regulations drive up the cost of energy. So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. The Obama administration's crusade against coal-fired power plants, which was launched on the back of discredited junk science about hyped global warming threats, has little to do with improving the environment and everything to do with lowering living standards by creating artificial scarcity. The EPA has now listed as harmful carbon dioxide that is part of the life cycle of the planet. New EPA rules dictate that utility companies will be forced to spend an initial outlay of $800 million to conform with regulations that mandate harmful emissions be reduced under the Clean Air Act. And yet power plants supplied by General Electric, one of Barack Obama's biggest campaign contributors, have received an EPA waiver and will not be subject to the new regulations. The new rules will exacerbate the problem of rolling blackouts, warns Donna Nelson, head of the Texas Public Utility Commission. Nelson said, quote, I have no doubt in my mind that this rule will result in reliability issues and rolling outages in Texas. Obama's strict enforcement of draconian EPA regulations has led to new clean-burning coal-fired plants being mothballed and other existing ones being shut down which has in turn led to Texas and other states becoming energy dependent. All of this, of course, will lead to significantly higher utility bills for U.S. citizens who are being assaulted with more and more expenses even as the threat of a double-dip recession lowers living standards. And so how many different ways in the midst of this vast economic global crisis have they said that it's the populations who have to pay for all these problems, whether it's economic or, or environmental or what have you, while the banks get all these secret insider loans and much worse. Now, we also have a report that Darren McBreen filed on this subject a few months ago as well. Again, we've been covering this in depth. Alex has other videos on it, too. Let's go to that now. I'm Darren McBreen with InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm here today at the Texas State Capitol. And we're about to find out if the people of Austin are aware that they are about to be hit by a wave of utility bill hikes as new EPA regulations drive up the cost of energy. 
What do you think about paying higher utility bills because of the EPA's new regulations against power plants? You know, there may be some new regulations coming up against power plants at this point, but unfortunately right now I think that our, our citizens uh, statewide and nationwide basically overburdened, especially with, with today's economic uh, developments and situations that are going on. I think rate hikes should be at a minimal to at least try to alleviate some of the burden on our, our, our taxpayers and our citizens nationwide and statewide. I know a lot of people that are going to be not only shocked but a little bit irritated about that as well. Absolutely. I mean, they're already, I mean, because it's such a hot summer. Exactly. You exactly. know, everybody's I mean, bills is already up through the roof. You're already paying through the roof because the ACs are running nonstop. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, on top of that and with a downturn economy, yeah, it it's, doesn't seem to jive that well. Of course, I don't want to pay higher utility bills. They're already extremely high right now as it is. Well, I don't want to pay more because, um, because of the carbon dioxide thing. That doesn't seem right, especially if it's not even proven. Generally, I, I prefer regulations that, that deter pollution um, and paying a little bit more for that than an unregulated environment. It all has to be regulated some way, right? It's going to mess our environment up. I understand the tax on carbon footprints, but I mean, who's, who's, you know, getting a new Lexus, you know what I mean? Do you think that carbon dioxide is dangerous? I think carbon di dioxide can be very dangerous. Okay, what, what do plants breathe? Carbon dioxide. Yeah, I think carbon, carbon dioxide is definitely dangerous, otherwise there wouldn't be any, uh, like, rules and laws to prevent it being... Okay, uh, what do plants breathe? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is turned into oxygen by plants. So I mean, we're, I mean, it has to be in the world. Obviously it's not all dangerous. Carbon dioxide isn't a dangerous gas, but when there's too much of it, it's a problem. Carbon dioxide, even though it's a natural gas uh, consumed by plants, uh, it can be dangerous because, uh, well everyone says it has to do with global warming. Behind me is the Holly Street Power Plant. It was partially closed in 2004 and officially shut down in 2007. Now it's simply a reminder of Austin's energy independence. Uh, what do you think about the fact that General Electric, one of Obama's biggest donors, that they get a waiver and they will not be subject to the regulation? That sounds like politics and lobbyists where it work. I mean, it's government, right? Okay. No surprise. Sounds plausible. Yeah, it sounds possible. There's no surprise about that. General Electric doesn't need any favors from anybody. They're a multi-billion dollar corporation. Are you aware that some of these new regulations are also shutting down power plants and this is causing some of the, the rolling blackouts throughout Texas? No, I wasn't familiar with that actually. Didn't realize that was going on. Lobbyists make a lot of money making striking these deals. There's a lot of things that we don't know and how government, you know, the tax breaks, the incentives, loopholes, you name it. So I think it's just one more to add to the list. Well, as you can see, Alex, the people here in Austin, they're aware that their utility rates are going up, but they're not sure of the real cause. This is Darren McBrain with InfoWars Nightly News. And, of course, there's a lot more to discuss on that. Another story about energy, a dead heat crematorium to sell power for National Grid. Uh, just kind of interesting, a crematorium is planning to become the first in the UK to generate electricity to sell the National Grid by using heat from its furnaces, off the dead, essentially. And it says the first phase due to be completed early next year will see a heat recovery system fitted to one burner providing heat for the building. A second phase is planned, which then will see the installation of turbines on the other two burners to generate electricity. A series of open days are planned in an effort to get public support for the scheme. Uh, now, another part that's interesting about that story is there's a story within that story. It talks about how many crematoria are currently replacing the furnaces to meet new government targets on preventing mercury emissions from escaping into the atmosphere undeniably toxic. Up to 16% of all mercury emitted in the UK comes from the crematoriums because of the fillings in the teeth. Left unchecked, they predicted a rise to 25%. The substance uh, accumulates in air, water, it's harmful to brains, kidneys, nervous system, and unborn children. So why are we allowing dentists to put it in our teeth? Good question. Other news about toxic substances. Kurt Nemo has detailed a new study, a 2011 study, proving fluoride causes brain damage. 
A study conducted by scientists in India demonstrates that consumption of sodium fluoride results in brain and neurological damage, published by K. Pradap Reddy of the University College of Sciences, Osmania University in Hyderabad, India. Now, we have some images from that study showing what actually happens to the nerve cells we're going to pull that up right here. And on the left, you see uh, undamaged, healthy nerve cells. And on the right, you see what happens under the conditions of fluoride, uh, kind of a larger nerve cell on the left, uh, smaller ones on the right. And uh, you can find that report linked in Kurt's article on Infowars.com. But really, this stuff does have a powerful effect. We've had the experts on, Dr. Paul Kana and others. So please look into that if you're not already informed. Meanwhile, it's not just fluoride they want to add to our water supply. Now there's yet another call to add lithium to the water supply, this time from a psychiatrist in Ireland who wants it added to the water, first in a small town test, later to the whole country. And this person cites a British Journal of Psychiatry study from when they added lithium to the water supplies in many towns in Texas. He said there was already a strong precedent for governments intervening in the operation of public water supply for health benefits by adding fluoride, obviously dubious. Of course, that's not the first call for lithium. A quick review, uh, many others have called for it. Fox News covered the mass drugging of society where they recommended putting lithium in the water. There was also a BBC report, lithium in water curbs suicide, again, based on a Japanese study advocating it be added to water. And a bioethics professor named Julian Salvesco says lithium should be added to the water, but that's just the beginning. We should have many other cognitive enhancements added to the water supply so our controllers can keep us passive and relatively dumb, unable to fight back against the system. That's all linked in a report I did in August 2010. So if you think fluoride's the end of the line, think again. They really want to mess with our water. So again, if you thought fluoride was the only problem uh, in what's being added to our food and water, think again. Everything from GMOs to this lithium proposal on down is really just what happens when governments get extreme power, when power is centralized in the hands of a few, especially if they happen to be eugenicists. If you don't know about it, look up the Brave New World plan, Brave New World Revisited, Bertrand Russell, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the very people who help prescribe vaccines to the mass populations, the Center for Disease Control, have their own series of corruptions. One of the top executives there, a female scientist, uh, was charged with child molestation and even bestiality. You may remember this report. We covered it a few weeks ago. The suspects, Dr. Kimberly Lindsay and Thomas Joseph Westerman. Dr. Lindsay is the second in command at the CDC's Laboratory Science Policy and Practice Program Office. Her career at the CDC has included oversight of a $1.5 billion terrorism preparedness budget. She's also been a top manager of HIV AIDS prevention. Now there's an update on that report. She is back at work. The senior government scientist facing child molestation and bestiality charges has returned to her high-powered job at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. And as the report mentioned, she helps oversee a very big uh, terrorism contract. She's done work with AIDS and a whole lot of others. Her title is Deputy Director for Laboratory Science Policy and Practice Program Office. And generally speaking, that agency helps prescribe all the fun vaccines uh, for your children, the list that gets longer and longer each year. Meanwhile, Fukushima news continues to get worse. ABC News in Australia reports that the fuel rods are now eating through solid concrete. Molten fuel rods at the Fukushima, Fukushima nuclear plant may have eaten two-thirds of the way through a concrete containment base, according to the plant's operators. What's worse, the operator's assessment comes about six months after international nuclear experts warned that molten fuel could eat through the containment vessel below the reactors. Of course, Alex has had on many of the experts, including Dr. Busby, discussing uh, all the various fallout, uh, no pun intended, or is it, I guess, on this terrible Fukushima tragedy and all the other terrible things they've been doing to our environment. We have to stop these dictators. 
Meanwhile, on the geopolitical front, after NATO strike, Pakistan adjusts rules of engagement. Uh, they previously had orders to take orders before firing back, but now that's changing. Pakistan's commanders in the wild Afghan border region can return fire if under attack without waiting for permission, the Army chief said on Friday, a policy change that could stoke tensions after Saturday's NATO strike that killed 24 Pakistani troops. We're, of course, going to talk with Pepe Escobar about that in a few moments. In the past, we were only guarding ourselves or reacting against militants, said the source, who requested anonymity. We've given our posts some more space to respond. If they're under attack, they should not wait for orders. Just another bizarre twist in all the escalations in that large, large, important region of the world. Meanwhile, there is a covert war going on in Iran. Of course, this week there were reports of a blast in Isfahan, a uh, non-enrichment and enrichment facility, but they do do nuclear research there. All eyes on Israel after second Iran blast there, and it talks about how they didn't even try to play it down in the Israeli government that they may have been behind it. However, a Jerusalem Post article takes kind of a different twist here talking about how it was extremely unlikely that a Western government perpetrated the attack. Of course, there's been many calls for war in Iran. Uh, the question is, how will they bring it about? A military analyst has said that it is, quote, extremely unlikely that a Western government perpetrated the attack. Uh, they go on to discuss in the article how no longer content to demand that Amina Dinajad stepped down and fair elections take place. The Green Movement began calling for and working towards the overthrow of the regime as a whole. Since last year, regime installations as well as key members of the Revolutionary Guards have been targeted on a regular basis. There's been a five-fold increase in the number of explosions at Iranian oil pipelines and refineries. So who's behind it? It goes on to discuss the attack two weeks ago on the Bidgana Air Force Base and two other, other Revolutionary Guard bases were conducted by members of Iran's anti-regime green movement, uh, one of those velvet revolutions backed by Western powers, including Soros. Uh, it targeted General Hassan Tarani Mogadim. However, it goes on to explain how Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei was scheduled to visit the Bidgana base at the time of the explosion, but was delayed. Then it goes on to explain how in May, the Abaddon, Abaddon oil refinery was bombed during a site visit by Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. So they're uh, not only disrupting facilities, but trying to carry out assassinations. And they go on to blast Obama in the saber-rattling thing. Thankfully, Obama's abandonment of the traditional U.S. role as leader of the free world has not prevented Western governments and regional forces from freedom from, for freedom from acting in their own common interests. So basically, in a roundabout way, they admit that Western interests are behind all these strange attacks, and hopefully it does not lead to all-out war. We really hope not. Meanwhile, Pepe Escobar has a very detailed article called The Shadow War in Syria. It's a bit complex and technical. I recommend you read the article for yourself, but basically you've got the NATO forces backing this covert civil war in Syria. You've read past headlines about where they're shipping in Libyan rebels to now be Syrian rebels to oust Assad. Uh, furthermore, Turkey's in on it. And this quote here, the pressure is relentless. Diplomats in Brussels have confirmed to Asia Times Online that the NATO and GCC operatives have set up a command center in Iskenderun in Hatay province in Turkey. Turkey. Crucial Aleppo in northwest Syria is very close to the Turkish-Syrian border, and the cover story for this new command center is to engineer humanitarian corridors to Syria. So again, they're carrying out semi-covert war, as they did in Libya. Uh, Pepe calls it a 2.0 version in Syria, again, under the humanitarian crisis uh, excuse. And so now with more on the situation in Syria and really all of the Middle East and Central Asia and geopolitics around the globe is Pepe Escobar. He's a longtime Asia Times correspondent and a true geopolitical expert. Pepe, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great pleasure. Uh, so I know we have this Syria article here, but you've been even more focused on the situation in Pakistan. Obviously, tensions have been heating up there with the recent strike uh, that NATO's basically calling accidental. 
Uh, why don't you highlight the most important things for us? Well, the most important thing is that NATO in the West, they are burning all the bridges that they have, even with the Pakistani military. They already burnt the bridges with the bulk of the Pakistani population, in fact. What happened, this incident less than a week ago was horrible because it was a basic NATO mistake. They have the coordinates of all these uh, uh, checkpoints and uh, police uh, advanced posts in the border, in the in all the agencies, the seven uh, agencies in the Pakistani side that border Afghanistan. And uh, if you, if you look at the, what they are saying in Peshawar, for instance, which they have a very lively Pakistani press in Peshawar, they say that there was no warning. Uh, there was an helicopter that came first. They threw flares. Then they came. The gunships came, and they started. Uh, deliberately killing people one by one, 24 uh, Pakistani soldiers. So how do you explain something like this? It's not a failure of communication. The Pakistani, say, the, the Pakistani army says, look, we got no warning whatsoever. They knew that this was a Pakistani post. There were no insurgents, let's put it this way, in the area. So uh, what is NATO going to do? Look, the, res the Pakistani response is very, very serious. Monday in Bonn, in Germany, like exactly 10 years after that famous Bonn conference, uh, I'm sure a lot of people will remember, after the so-called end of the Afghan war in 2001, they're going to have a 10th anniversary <laughs> commemoration come uh, meeting of Americans, Europeans, Turks, and guess who's not going to be at the table? The Pakistanis. So you cannot expect the West to come up with a solution for Afghanistan without Pakistan and even worse without Iran because Western Afghanistan, most of what happens is in close contact with Iran. They are Tajiks, uh, you know, it's uh, four hours by taxi, uh, let's put it this way, from the Iranian Afghan border to Mashhad, the big Iranian city to the east. So they're not going to be on the table. What, what does the U.S. and NATO expect to accomplish in a conference like this? It doesn't make sense. Well, uh, can you draw out some of the important geopolitical significance with Pakistan? China, of course, saying any attack on Pakistan would be equivalent to attacking China. Uh, obviously, the distribution networks are tied to all the powers in Central Asia. Uh, help us draw. Help us see what's going on here. Okay, uh, okay, first point is the distribution network that feeds the U.S. and NATO troops in Afghanistan. Pakistan, these last few days, they cut off that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a snake full of lorries, that, let's put it this way, that goes from Karachi in southern Pakistan to Quetta and then across the border to southern Afghanistan, to Kandahar especially. And then another snake that goes north to the Khyber Pass and then crosses on the way to Jalalabad in Kabul. So uh, if you see the photographs, they are amazing because you, you have like uh, hundreds of kilometers of lorries that they are stuck there because they cannot go anywhere, at least for the moment. This is Pakistani retaliation. And there's another distribution network, which is called NDN, the Northern Distribution Network, that goes all across Central Asia. It's very complicated, crosses Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and then gets into Northern Afghanistan. But uh, US and NATO are supplied, but less than 20% goes through this route. So if you start antagonizing the Russians, for instance, which, which gave permission for this route to exist, soon we're going to we may come to a situation within the next few weeks or maybe months where all the troops, American and NATO, in Afghanistan, they cannot be supplied anymore because Pakistan is being antagonized and Russia, by a myriad of ways, let's put it this way, is also being antagonized. The missile defense uh, uh, controversy, the fact that uh, an invasion, a probable invasion, or even destabilization of Syria, the Russians already said at the UN Security Council, forget about it, we're not going to vote for a resolution. And if you come here, uh, watch out, because we have a naval base in Syria. 
The Russians have a naval base in the port of Tartus, the eastern Mediterranean in Syria. And obviously, if anything happens uh, via NATO, with Turkey and with France, and even without the U.S., the U.S. in the background, as it is at the moment, uh, the first thing they're going to do, they, they're going to do is buy buy a Russian base in Syria. So the Russians are following this very closely, and they are getting closer and closer with Pakistan, which is something that until let's say a year ago was not even on the cards, and the crux of this uh, uh, rapprochement, let's say, this getting together is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO. That's a mechanism that it's also 10 years old, Russia, China, and three of the Central Asian stands. And we have four observers at the SCO, including Iran and Pakistan. And the Russians already said, and they said that for the first time only a few weeks ago, they want Pakistan as a full member. And the Chinese are saying, we also want Iran as a full member. What does that mean in practice? It means that soon in Asia, we're going to have a mechanism that, of course, it's not like NATO because it's not primarily a military alliance, but it's a, a security mechanism, an economic cooperation mechanism, and soon they're going to develop a military integration as well. So on one side, we're going to have Russia, China, the Central Asians, Pakistan and Iran, for instance, and on the other side, we're going to have NATO. Uh, who can come up with the best solution for Afghanistan? The Afghans themselves are saying, they are observers of the SEO, by the way, the Afghans themselves are saying, look, we need a regional solution with all the internal players on the table in uh, Afghanistan, but we all are neighbors on the table, especially. And uh, when you look at it, there's definitely no place for NATO or for Washington in this arrangement. Yeah. And so obviously the larger question, though, is the World War III scenario, uh, is it going to happen? Because Syria is on the hit list, Iran's on the hit list, and things are heating up there at the same time this stuff is happening with Pakistan. Uh, I mean, what do you really see in the cards here? Look, I'm not apocalyptic, you know, I may be very pessimistic sometimes mm -hmm. uh, when you look at reality, of course, but uh, realistically, what's going on is uh, the Pentagon still wants to implement its doctrine that it's called full spectrum dominance, that it's uh, official Pentagon doctrine since 2002. So land, air, sea domination, cyberspace domination, and even outer space domination, of course. And Middle East is just a way to get to the big price, which is Asia. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a few commentators, like including Michael Clare, for instance, I read his piece, I think uh, one or two days ago, already talking about what does it mean uh, Obama's Pacific century or Hillary Clinton's Pacific Center. What does that mean? It means that the U.S. or the Obama administration, because of pressure by the Pentagon generals, they are already launching a new Cold War against China, especially. But don't forget, a war against, against China can be a war against Russia as well, because their inter the Russian interests are in Central Asia, are in the Caucasus, are in the Mediterranean as well. China's interests are in Africa, some of them in the Middle East, because they import a lot of oil from Saudi Arabia and gas from Iran, and across Asia. So the Pentagon wants to pick a fight simultaneously with Russia and China. I'm not sure this is a very intelligent proposition, to say the least. Well, uh, if you could also get into some of the most basic facts about your Syrian article, because to me, it looks like an all out covert war. There's a lot of uh, allies and covert things going on. They've just shipped over a lot of the Libyan rebels now in Syria as rebels. Yes, uh, I think that the most important element, at least for the past few weeks, it, it's something as few sources confirmed in uh, France, some other sources in, Tur in Turkey, we confirmed with Brussels. And uh, diplomats in Brussels told us explicitly, yes, there is a control and command center already established in southern Turkey near the Turkish-Syrian border. It's in a place called Iskenderun, which is a, it's a very small town, but it's very close to a big city, very important, Antakya, 
which is the Antioch of, of biblical times, right? And across the border, like, you know, if you go from the border to Aleppo, for instance, it's half an hour, 40 minutes. It's Aleppo, which is the big city in northern Syria. And it's the largest uh, uh, Syrian city as well. Over 2.5 million people live there. This region, most people are Sunnis, but there are a lot of Kurds living there as well. So what is the strategy? Considering that Russia and China vetoed a UN security resolution authorizing a Libya-style operation against Syria, uh, considering that the U.S. does not to be at the forefront of this expedition, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. In fact, the whole thing is subcontracted to basically France and Turkey. So what we have in this place is Skenderun. It's very, very important from now on. We have uh, French intelligence people. We have the British MI6. We have Saudis, Qataris, and people from the Emirates as well. We have engineers and naval officers, very qualified people. So they are trying to organize near the border a sort of a northern insurrection in Libya. Oh, I'm sorry, in Syria. I say Libya because Libya is on my <laughs> mind because it's basically the same thing now remixed, right? Absolutely. So, so now, so now the scenario is, okay, we try to launch an insurrection north in uh, Syria, uh, in the big cities, or in the small cities, I'm sorry, of course, like homes, but especially trying to get the big price, which is Aleppo. Mm -hmm. If Aleppo would uh, fall to the insurgents, let's put it this way, which is a mix of uh, defectors from the Syrian army and these uh, foreign mercenaries. For the moment, there are not many people. I'm in contact with a guy in Holmes. He's a very good informant, you know, for what's going on on the ground. And he's telling me, look, we haven't seen these people here. And the support for the Free Syrian Army in, in this area, at least, is mixed. A lot of people view them as um, criminals, you know, pure and simple. There are a lot of uh, uh, gangs in the area. Uh, people report they have been uh, harassed, you know, cars stolen, that kind of stuff. Uh, petty crime, basically. And uh, not many people are talking about serious, uh, let's say, uh, guerrilla bands attacking uh, the Syrian army. And another point that it's important, there has not been a mass defection from the Syrian intelligence system, the military or the police, at least so far. This tells us that the support for the regime is still very solid among the people that are ruling Syria, and including the trading classes, the bazaaris, né? let's put it this way. They are very important in Damascus and in Aleppo, both big cities, and they're still more or less siding with the regime, including the Sunnis, because they don't know what could happen next. If there is a civil war, who's going to rule the country afterward? Nobody trusts this... Uh, Syrian National Council that was established uh, in Paris and in Turkey a little bit. In fact, there is an interview at the Wall Street Journal today of the president of this council. And it's ridiculous, you know, he's like, <laughs> like he was briefed at Washington or at Tel Aviv. He's, doing, he's emitting all the right signals, but you cannot trust these people. And the Syrians themselves, they're saying, we don't trust these people. Most of them are exiles. You know, they're not people who lived here and uh, understand the regime and understand what we need in terms of more political participation and all that. They're a bunch of opportunists, just like the opportunist, opportunists in Libya, you know, hasn't changed much. So we have to look over the past few weeks, at least, we have to be careful looking at, is there going to be a destabilization of northern Syria? If that happens, maybe we are on our way to uh, destabilization of the whole country, but basically fueled by foreign troops, by mercenaries, and the power that is coordinating all this is Turkey, which brings us to, let, let me just finish with this, because nobody knows the answer to this question. What do the Turks imagine they will accomplish by destabilizing one of their neighbors, considering that their official foreign policy Basically, it's called zero problems with our neighbors. Right. So still nobody knows what is the Turk game. You know, uh, I've been trying to get it 
Uh, from, from, from people that I know in, in Turkey, they don't know. Uh, people in Brussels say, look, I think maybe there is some kind of deal, but we don't know the terms of this, a backroom deal that would obviously involve the U.S. But we don't have elements, and it, it's pure speculation, of course. What we do know is the very convergence of interest between the Turks and the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. Right. means Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and all the other Persian Gulf monarchies. They want to get rid of uh, the Assad regime because it's an Arab secular republic. They want something closer to the Muslim Brotherhood in power. And this is true. If, if the Assad regime falls, guess who's going to inherit Syria? The Muslim Brotherhood, just like they are inheriting Egypt. We saw the, the, these first initial results at the Egyptian election. Who's ahead? The Muslim Brotherhood, over 40%, and an Islamist Salafi party with almost 25%. And these people in Syria, they are also popular, especially in the poorer areas in the countryside and in some of these places where the protests started including the small towns uh, in the border, uh, the Jordanian-Syrian border, and in homes as well. So, uh, look, the, the scenario ahead, if there is really a destabilization of the regime, is horrendous. Nothing good will come out of it. And I, I don't see anything good coming out of it. Certainly not democracy. Yes, sir. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add that we should keep an eye on, or uh, are these pretty much the main proxies at the moment? Yes, this, I suggest everybody keep an eye on this Syrian National Council. What they're saying, uh, if they're going to visit, uh, if they're going to visit Washington, special. They're they're more or less based in Paris and Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, keep an eye on what the Turks are saying out loud, because they few days ago, three days ago, uh, they slapped sanctions on Syria, and the sanctions are exactly the same package as the Arab League sanctions. Uh, and also, let's keep an eye on, there's, I would say there's a sort of window of opportunity for something drastic to happen uh, in the next few weeks before, uh, you know, uh, the campaign in the U.S., the presidential campaign in the U.S. starts in Iowa and then in New Hampshire. So things could happen between Christmas and New Year that we don't know about, of course. Yeah. Well, we'll keep watching and we appreciate you joining us, of course. Thank, Thank you. Much. My pleasure. Thanks very much. And that's it tonight for the InfoWars Nightly News. Of course, a lot of news to keep an eye on and continue observing. We'll be back next week. Stay tuned.